Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a, quite an introduction. Hopefully I don't disappoint anyone here. Um, so I'll be going through the, the basis of scopes technology. So um, what is encoding field measurement? Um, essentially, how does it work in terms of the technology? And then what are some of the applications that um, the, both the, the ETH, who, who the company was founded out of, has pursued as, as well as other users? So um, actually, this is now last month was the 11th anniversary of Scope. So it's been around for 11 years now. Uh, founded out of ETH. Uh, this is one of the founders here, Christoph. Um, maybe some of you know him, maybe not. Um, and you would recognize this type of scanner here, I think. Um, as a little bit of history, this is the initial commercial product from Scope. So these are the field sensors out at the front. We have these little uh, set of spaghetti strands here and then a preamp box and then there, there's some other equipment that goes into the back room. Um, over the last 11 years we've made some improvements and, and now that similar product looks just like this. So this is what we call our dynamic field camera. So there's a, oh, I'm not pointing in the right screen. Uh, there's an array of sensors in the camera head here um, followed by the, the, the first stage preamp electronics and then it heads out um, through the Faraday cage to our, our back end which consists of a spectrometer and some uh, real-time data processing equipment. So we are moving even more now towards um, trying to get these onto real MR systems. So if you're in the room, you can see on the table here, this is a mock-up of what we call a NeuroCam. You see the, the image here on the, on, the, on the screen. This is a integrated receiver coil with a set of field sensors built into it, um, and then a similar set of you know, preamp electronics for our uh, field sensors, just as a quick introduction there. So during this, um, this talk, I would guess it'll be about 30 minutes or so. Um, we'll go through a bit of um, an anal analogy to imaging, um, how we do MR image formation and coding, um, how we add to it, and I'll, I'll use the, uh, the kind of ambitious term of complete encoding, um, what this encoding field measurement really does, um, how it's been applied to a few different unique MR systems, so kind of these, these one of a kinds or, or, or one of several that, that are around the world. Um, how it's applied to diffusion, both at 3T and at 7T, um, some 7T general results, and then essentially how, how you put this entire thing together in, in an MR system. So first, um, if we think of an imaging system, what, what we're doing with any technique, whether it's CT or optics or anything, is we're trying to represent the object um, in some form of, in this case, digital space. So in order to more faithfully represent the object um, in an optical camera, for example, if you think of chromatic aberration, uh, uh, spherical aberration, um, as these are different ways that light interacts with the imaging system itself, um, and then other different types of absorbance. So, in a similar way, when we look at the entire MR system, and just using this kind of standard MR scanner image, each subsystem has a, has a different job um, and has different assumptions that we make about it. So the magnet, which in general is responsible for polarizing the sample, so we find the difference between spin up and spin down protons. Um, we assume that this magnet is stable over time, that it, it has the same field, um, and more accurately than all, the, all of the protons we're interested in have the same precession frequency. And we assume that it's uniform um, over both space and time. Uh, this assumption is generally not, not great, but it depends on your application. Uh, the second major subsystem, the, the gradient, um, it's a big electromagnet uh, responsible for the spatial encoding of the sample or whatever manipulations of, of the sample you're doing. If it's diffusion, if it's, um, if it's an MRE motion encoding lobe or something like that, you are manipulating uh, the mag the, you're manipulating, manipulating the spins during the experiment. And we, we assume these gradients are linear um, or we want to, we assume that they're repeatable. That is, when we play out one gradient pulse, it's the same as the fifth gradient pulse, which is designed to be the same, which is the same as the nth gradient pulse. Um, and then we assume that it's a high fidelity system where it actually plays out what we program it to. Um, and that often goes into our assumptions in the reconstruction later. Uh, finally, we have the ERF. So that's responsible for exciting and reading out the signal. Again, we, we assume it's uniform and stable. Um, as you know, the higher field strength you go, the less this assumption holds. So in general, when we make an image, we have these series of gradient and RF waveforms, which is riding on top of your ideally perfectly polarized sample from your perfect magnet. 
Um, we do some image reconstruction with a certain set of assumptions and you end up with an image. Now, over the last 20 years or so, kind of with the advent of, set of sense or grapho or whatever parallel imaging method is your favorite, we've gotten used to adding some additional information into our reconstruction process. So if we use the coil sensitivity maps or the V1 minus um, measurements of our sample in the coil, we use that extra information to inform our reconstruction to do better somehow, whether you're pushing spatial or temporal resolution or whatever you want to correct. Additionally, if we gather information about the subject itself in the B0 map, you can then correct for, say, EPI distortion in that fMRI or diffusion scan. There's a lot of other ways that the MR system can be affected in a non ideal way and have all different time scales and all different um, amplitudes. If you're talking about very short time scales, uh, gradient delays between the gradient and RF subsystem can manifest. Um, this is usually calibrated on site during install because then they, they know exactly the cable length of the gradient amplifiers between the coil and the amplifier, and the same with the RF. They can measure all those phase delays and then calibrate this out. But maybe your system changes over time. Maybe they do a, a, all the way up through um, eddy currents in the cryostat or um, mechanical oscillations of the system. I did see your airbag system downstairs, so hopefully that's mostly taken care of. But if the system is moving, it'll cause um, artifacts because you're not accounting for what that does to your spatial encoding. Um, and then especially at high field, um, the chest wall motion itself affects the encoding field at the head, if you're, again, if you're interested in neuro. So what we want to do is add to these gradient and RF waveforms the monitoring of the spatial encoding process, use that information in our reconstruction uh, to be able to generate a representation of the object without those, um, without those assumptions being made that everything is, is perfect. All right, so to complete encoding, I already spoke a little bit about coil sensitivity maps and a delta B zero map as an example. Um, and what we're adding is the measurement of the spatial encoding. So here we're showing a 2D spiral. Um, this is what you think of normally as case space, so KX, KY, um, and then zeroth order or center frequency um, at three time up to 32 milliseconds. Um, a few higher order terms, so second, third in, in script harmonics. And then we do also calculate the concomitant fields based on the first order terms. And um, this is using the standard Bernstein uh, model. Acquiring this, uh, this is one way to do it, where you add a whole bunch of sensors, I have a pile of those on the table over there to your existing coil. Um, or if, if you allow us, we would build one for you as well. So that's a brief overview of everything you put together to do this experiment. Now I'll go into a little bit of how we actually do this, which I think is a little bit more interesting. Um, this field probe, as we call it, is just in, I'll point on the screen here, is an MR active capillary. Um, it can be a, a doped water. Um, in our concurrent measurement systems where we put them in with a coil, they're, they're a fluorine compound, so they're off proton resonance and they don't um, impact your the primary NMR experiment that you're doing. Um, then there's a uh, usually a five turn solenoid um, some, a susceptibility matched plug around the edge to preserve lifetime and two matching electronics. And these are generally arranged in a sphere. So if we have points on a sphere, we can then calculate within that sphere using Maxwell's equations, the field evolution, which has gone on uh, during whatever time. And I'll go into a little more detail now. So each, each probe, when we hit it with a pulse, usually we use a, it's like an eight millisecond hyperbolic secant pulse. Um, we produce an FID in that probe. And if you track the phase of an FID, you end up with a field measurement at that point. So we extract the phase information from those FIDs. And then since we know the positions of each probe and we know the local off resonance from a calibration scan, we can fit these phase data to a spherical harmonic model and then plot these spherical harmonic coefficients through time. So now we have a description through time um, at a one microsecond update rate of the field fitted to sphere harmonic basis functions. All right, so now that we've done all this, how do we actually use it? So if we can apply this in diffusion weighted imaging, for example, um, that there are different field terms or different field evolutions which are deviating from our assumptions for different diffusion encoding directions. So the movie you're looking at here, this is a static phantom. So I think it's a water phantom. Um, it's in 
it's in the scanner. Um, it's um, a single slice is being scanned, and the directions or the, the dimension you're scrolling through here is different diffusion encoding directions. The readout is the same. Um, and that this is the kind of characteristic shearing and warping you would see in a diffusion scan if you didn't take care of this eddy current related diffusion or eddy current related artifact. And we can directly visualize the encoding fields which lead to this, uh, this type of artifact. So these are some higher order terms for a diffusion direction one, two, and three. But we'll call them X, Y, or diffusion encoding along X, Y, or Z. Visualized another way, uh, diffusion encoding direction one, two, and three. Uh, they have different uh, nuisance phase uh, measurements uh, for different directions. So to account for this, we adjust our image reconstruction from taking care of a standard case space in this phase term up here, as we would normally think of it, um, and adjust it to a, a general um, higher order phase model. And now then you have to solve this problem um, iteratively, usually, unless you're really clever with math. But this is accounting for these additional phase terms. And if we do that, um, and this is now the same movie you saw on the left, uh, if we do our, what I'll call the field aware reconstruction, we then reconstruct this image uh, without the artifacts due to that additional phase issue. Questions at this point? So can you go back to the slides before this? I want to see that, yeah, there was one more. Yeah, so this is zero for second order, third order. Yep. So this, uh, so x axis is uh, time? This is time, yes. So this so is a- the aggregation window? I'm sorry? Is the time? The yes. The window. Exactly. So if this is deviation from nominal, so first order, if it was X and it was read, um, you would see the, the the read gradients here. And I can pull up um, pull up some traces here. So this this is the this is the UI actually. So if I go to this guy, move that over here. This. So this this would be the the phase due to the read gradient. Here's the read gradient itself. And if we step go to let's pick one here. I look at three different diffusion directions, and then this is one of these higher order terms happening at the same time as the read gradient. So that's that's what you're looking at there, and it's, it's all those different terms. Each one has a, a different behavior. The so way that I can measure these. Uh, your gradient is made spatial, they have something they resolve time. So the, the extent to which you can correct it, the extent to which you can correct it depending on the gradient system? Um, that you, you can only correct for linear? Uh, it's not dependent on the gradient system. Okay. Um, so our, our, our measurement is um, whatever is in, in the field we will measure. Um, the gradient system dependence, which I'll get to a bit later, if you have a much smaller gradient set, you may not get enough variation by only going to third orders. So for, for one gradient, one I'll show, it's a very tight gradient, it's an insert gradient, that you have to go to fifth order to get all, enough variation to make the image look correct. So, so you want to, once you get this information, you use it to modify your cross-season potential rate to improve the quality that you show, right? Mm. So, so if, if you think about the MR system, the only knobs you have are the center frequency adjust and then X, Y, and Z gradients. So, so far, I don't think there's a way to modify the higher orders fast enough to correct this in the acquisition. You really have to do this in the reconstruction. Oh, it's all those yep. things you can do yep. in Yep, okay. this is done in the recon. Okay. It's not fast enough to feedback into the system? Uh, you could feedback linear terms, but to correct a, a higher spatial order effect, you don't have any way to adjust that basis function in the field. Is linear correction be sufficient? Um, for, so for this is sort of like some 
the company also do this kind of motion probe to to uh, determine the motion of yep. the person in real time, and then yep. we would feed back this system to modify that gradient and the center frequency, etc. Yeah, and, and and that's for rigid body correction, and so for that linear is fine. Um, and, and I mean, and they do it by shifting the coordinate system, which is just adjusting your gradient coordinates. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for that it's fine. Um, you could feed back into a linear system, but um, the application I'm showing here, diffusion, um, the issues that many groups seem to be worried about is more this type of distortion, which this is directly caused by those higher order terms rather than a linear term. If you had big linear term problems, um, your system just needs to be recalibrated because you know your your standard kind of EPI phase correction should be taking care of most of that um, unless it's drifted over time. Sorry. You may get there later, but um, is it pure physics or where are these? Uh, this one is a Chiva. It's a Chiva. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you probably have done this um, human or GD before. Have you maybe played on Google and can prove there? Or show us some comparison between render. Mm -hmm. And they have a similar sort of problem or one blender better than some other blender. I think the overall statement is that th they're mostly the same current generation systems to to an extent anyone would would really worry about it. Um, I also have to fairly represent each of them. Um, but, but you have Data yeah. From all three vendors, right? Yeah, I, I don't I don't have data from all users with me from all three vendors, but you know our but you have experience with all one our yeah, we do and our user group does and, and they're very happy to discuss either the the things they're really happy about their scanner or the things that they're not so happy about their scanner. But you also can also in principle measure how stable the gradient system is with respect to EPI, etc. Yep. For a particular MR system, right? Yes. But sometimes exactly. you know the the cooling system of the gradient the amplifier is not very yep. good. Sometimes some ingredients will be shipped in, uh, in the gradient and the signal. Yep. So so let me. This is leading toward just wanted to drive through the interface and look at a few data sets for a little bit. But let me go through the rest of this and then and then we'll we'll, we'll catch up with that. So what I have here is some what I call unique system results. So I was mentioning this insert gradient system. So this is the, the insert gradient that goes into the Philips system and ETH. Um, so a very performant system. So with for doing diffusion, you get 200 millitesla and 600 slew rate. But really need to know what the system is doing. So I mean, this is just a, a this is just a pretty picture slide. But just to say, this is an echo time of 19 milliseconds for 1,000 uh, uh, seconds per millimeter squared. Uh, and 0.7 millimeter in plane. Okay. But how, how did they get there? So we really needed to know exactly what that system is doing. So zeroth and first order correction, we call it zeroth and first order model, where you just do the linear case space and the center frequency offsets. You still have quite some, well, I'm not working on the right screen, you still have quite some artifact down here. Uh, if we go to a fifth order position measurement, where we actually take our field camera and do multiple measurements, rotating and translating it to build a higher order model. You still don't quite get there, but we had to directly um, include the concomitant field terms in this to be able to get um, an image that made sense out of that gradient system. So, um, and then just another slot, another shot. Okay, yeah, so it's high resolution, it's 3T. Um, you get the point. Um, you can do other fun stuff. So they did a, a 30 echo spiral scan. So this is you know, doing some kind of cheap parameter mapping. With that lot of the scan, so you go from PD rated to very TT rated. Um, and you can look at different voxels and, and watch the uh, parameters uh, shift. So, if you have a special system, you need to understand what it's doing. So, to um, more normal um, applications, uh, backing up in, in diffusion, you know, before the advent of shielded gradients or even um, before we got a bit better at doing reconstructions. The way to do a well-registered diffusion scan was to do a twice refocused EPI. So then your eddy currents would null at the echo time. Um, but you give up SNR because it takes a long time to do those two refocusing pulses. So we moved to a single refocus EPI. Great, you get more signal. Um, but what we want to mention is that if we move from a single refocus EPI to a spiral, you can get even more signal because you're 
kx ky equals zero point is much closer to your excitation and you don't have to wait or even if you're doing partial Fourier for some of those higher um, higher spatial frequency k space lines to be acquired before you cross the center of the space so spiral uh, shorter at the time more more snr and then just showing the combined images here uh, this is also um, shown there's a paper out now um, in MRM doing spiral diffusion weighted imaging uh, at different resolutions. So really, as you get higher and higher resolution, you gain more and more. And this is done at 3T. This is also done on an Achiba. Um, and this was acquired with the NeuroCam as well. So this was a, a fully monitored acquisition. So why doesn't everybody do it? Uh, well, it's hard. Now, this is not quite a fair comparison. This is with a lot of corrections people would normally use turned off. But when you start doing fusion lobes and then you acquire a spiral readout right afterwards, it gets very messy. So what we propose is doing a concurrent measurement of the spatial temporally varying dynamic fields with a set of, of probes. Um, incorporating that information into our reconstruction, um, and then you can end up with something like, like this. So 1.3 millimeter length, um, again, on an Chiba. Moving to 7T, uh, if you want to do more interesting uh, biophysical measurements, so moving from linear tensor encoding, planar tensor encoding, spherical tensor encoding, you have to spend more time doing your diffusion preparation rather than your imaging. Um, and especially when you're at 7T, you need to do your imaging more quickly because your signal's all going to decay away even faster than at 3T. So if, if you spend all your time encoding your signal, uh, you somehow need to get back that SNR. So one, one group up in Montreal, uh, they, have a, they have a Terra up there that they use. Uh, they implemented a spherical tensor encoding experiment with a spiral readout at the end. And we're able to reduce their echo time from about 110 milliseconds to 78 uh, with the spiral. So this is 1.4 millimeter isotropic. And what I like about what they did is they showed these different correction steps. So our, our nominal trajectory, or, or if we say we trust the scanner encoding fields um, and no static LP0 correction, maybe you say your, your B equals zero scan or you, your anatomic uh, image here looks okay. But as soon as you turn on the diffusion gradients, you lose all your contrast. Um, adding a static LP0 correction, maybe you're even happier with your B equals zero scan, but your diffusion scan still isn't look where you want it to be. So when we combine both of these two techniques together, um, we are able to really resolve the uh, gray white matter boundary um, and do this across many different diffusion encoding directions in. Is it that the B0 correction is the adherence to your uh, dynamic field measurement or? Um, so you, you have to do the static delta B0 measurement separately through whatever method is your is your favorite. Um, and then we have the ability in our reconstruction software to apply it to the image. Um, what was I going to say? I, I don't recall. So spherical tensor encoding, is that's not Q space. Do they have a special name for that? Or is that just like O space or all these other names for different diffusion things? I don't remember. Anyway. And then just in, in general for 7T, if we look at something like a, a T2 star weighted GRE image. So this is 0 0.3 millimeter in plane, two, mil two, two millimeter slice thickness. Uh, maybe that looks okay. Um, but we've also acquired it with a, uh, a snapshotted navigator where we're looking at the breathing fields through time. So before and after we, we've corrected for that additional phase due to the patient breathing um, in, in the scanner. And there's a, a bagged up difference image. One more example of the same thing. I didn't, I wasn't trained in 70, so I don't know as much about it, but it, when I look at this type of shading, does that look like B1 plus shading or, or not? I don't know. But yeah, it, it ends up being the offsets due to the patient breathing again. So um, kind of the right and left differences. So in this case, you would apply a dynamic uh, Exactly, that's that's acquired it's with- kind of pre-scan? Um, it, it's acquired during the scan. So that's, that's with these little uh, snake looking things placed around the coil to measure while the imaging experiment is running to measure the field. 
and that's incorporated into the recap. So why here you have the dynamic zero, but there you have to separate the zero. So I'll I'll I'll. I'll adjust my terminology a little bit then. I'll say that static delta B0 is the susceptibility induced field changes like uh, auditory canal or sinus or something like that. That all needs to be measured um, with a traditional image-based method, something like that. So that's very high spatial specificity, but hopefully very low temporal changes. So hopefully you can measure that once. What we're then measuring is a dynamic field change and, and the spatial specificity is only because from the spherical harmonic coefficients, but it's measured on a one microsecond update rate. So that's our dynamic field measurement uh, versus the static delta B0 measurement. And, and we do that at the dynamic field measurement. Let me try to understand. So hmm. if, you, if you incorporate that concept into this whole EPS scan, you have to modify your pulse sequence to yes. add this small. Um, you have to mo modify your sequence to add a trigger but our experiment is is the fluorine frequency NMR experiment going on within our probes, mm -hmm. so it doesn't affect the proton experiment that you're doing to image the brain. But you are using the same RF chain to excite. No, we we have a separate RF backend which goes in the, in the technical room and does transmit. Still has some excitation. Yeah, there's there's that little solenoid coil in there, and there's a, a little fluorine sample inside. So this is it's it's it is. It, yep. It, it's its own little separate NMR experiment going on. Okay. Separate excitation and receiving. And receiving and data processing and everything. Yep. And that sync with the main standards clock. Yeah, so we we take a 10 megahertz clock input from the scanner as well. Um, there's a little bit more to do also because of the differences in the digital receive chain between the MR system and our system. So we have to do a, a synchronization between the two. Uh, but we haven't documented how we've done it other places. Um, and so far, it works for the three. Well, it works for GE, Siemens, Philips, and Canon so far. Um, additional comments. Um, I'm not an fMRI person, but um, if you want to flexibly sample for fMRI, you want to do a spiral out in or in out, um, the ability to kind of arbitrarily sample um, is something that we support. If you know the encoding fields, then these are kind of inherently co-registered to your anatomic scans as well. So the, the levels of distortion are much lower, so they really they lay on top of your, your MP rage or your MP2 rage or whatever you're acquiring to register to much better. There's one other example. This was an interesting comparison between measuring your encoding fields, um, predicting them with an impulse response function, um, and then looking at the nominals. So this is a spiral fMRI experiment. Uh, where they used their monitored data to reconstruct their image. So while the subject was in the scanner, uh, they built an image. Uh, they built a model of their MR scanner. So since a gradient system is basically an LRC circuit um, and has certain resonances within it, it's a little simplified. Uh, has certain resonances. You can measure what the gradient system would do given a test pulse, um, and then you can build up an entire model to say what what will the gradient do with a certain waveform, and then predict. <coughs> So that worked also pretty well. There's a little bit of increased artifact level. Um, and then um, just playing out waveforms um, kind of a naive fashion, but this is what they ended up for a, a spiral. So three stages of comparison there. Um, and then if, if you can interpret uh, these activation maps, great. Otherwise, I would point you to the, the paper, um, and I can send that to you later. Sorry, so what is the GIRI? Perfect. Yep. How do you do that again? That? Yeah, so this is you, you, you play out a series of test lobes on your gradient and you measure the response using our system. Um, and then you vary the frequency oh, and amp lobe. like a play out a triangle on the gradient. Uh -huh. And it has a certain frequency content and a certain amplitude. Uh -huh. And you measure the response in field oh, with, um, either, either with a field camera or you can use something like the Dunn method where you do two parallel planes and make kind of a field camera virtual field camera in a phantom. There are advantages, disadvantages to both. Um, and then you vary the frequency and amplitude of those pulses and build up a full spectral map of your gradient subsystem. And then you get a transfer function of the entire system. The impulse response. Exactly. Yep. Gradient impulse response function, curve. So that would not yep. be the count for the respiration rate. Exactly. Yep. So that, that, that could be one reason why that this showed a little bit higher artifact level than the concurrently measured experiment.
it's, it's all about how many assumptions you're willing to live with. That's more sort of a talking into sort of schematic you know, the impossible spot. Yep, it's it's a linear time. Exactly. Effect on the response. You you make a linear time invariant assumption about your system. So if, for example, you run your gradient really hard and you're very high RMS on your driver, maybe your driver starts to droop, and then that violates that assumption. And so then you'd have artifact from that assumption being incorrect. So what would be other factors uh, leading to temperature? Um, I mean, there's temperature does a few things. You know, the, the center frequency will drift with temperature. Um, the gradient coil will soften, and those resonances will change, and so your impulse response will change. Yes, as you have, as it's most of all these things change with the temperature, that could be itself be a model to predict. Exactly, and and there's some there's some literature out there, you know, doing a few measurements like this and correlating correlating them to gradient coolant output temperature. Then maybe you bin your impulse response function based on this output temperature and that output temperature. Yeah. Um, the more information you add in, you can probably build a model which even more accurately characterizes your 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 gradient subsystem or basically your gradient and your gradient magnet interaction. I guess what I'm getting at is I know some other groups are doing this sort of impulse response mm -hmm. measurement. That 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 can work. That's a much cheaper solution yep. than those. Right? Yep. So this is assuming that the real time has, has many issues, mm -hmm. but as both can be predicted by a single measurement yep. each time, yep. and then can be predicted by whatever the temperature or other things. Yeah, the, the, the Wurzberg group in particular is doing quite a lot of work with this, um, and they, you know, it's certainly an option. Um, one comment is you can put the phantom in there and you spend 8, 10, 24 hours doing these measurements, which if you have time is great. Um, if you have uh, one of our systems, you put the camera in and you run it in 10 minutes and you have the answer. So there's, is that worth the extra money? That's not for me to judge. And then you have the fact that you're, you're running an impulse response measurement and your system is not in the same state it is when you're doing the imaging scan. So you, you have to, um, you have to play out this impulse response sequence rather than your diffusion sequence. So you can either directly measure what's going on in the system due to your diffusion sequence, or you can try and fake it for a while, and then you have to play out your impulse response measurement sequence. So it's, it's one difference in workflow. So yeah, I mean, you, you'll notice that Jeff down, down at NIH doesn't have one of our systems. So that's, he, he does it his way. Um, and then there are many other groups do it using that type of method. Any group have done a fair version of the tool to see how accurate the, the real time response can be just compared to the this can be the sort of gold standard to as a sort of reference. Yeah, so there's um, some recent work out of the Western Ontario group, and I can try and get this reference over to you where they compared um, using a, a field measurement as a gold standard and then um, changing their eddy current model to a time varying eddy current model in their reconstruction. Um, and they did pretty well doing that. Um, I think I, I'd have to read the paper again. I don't think it's exactly what you're asking for. Uh, there was some work a few years ago, I think it was in the, see the Paris or the Montreal ISMRM of a group from Würzburg came over to the NH and tried this at 1.5T, where they compared a field camera impulse response function and a phantom based impulse response function. They claimed they were the same. I have my own thoughts about the experiment, but um, you can read the paper and draw your conclusions. I'll, I'll find that one as well. So it's the that paper, and then what's the other one I just said? Yeah, yeah, it's Western Ontario. Right? Yeah, so the, it's yeah, it's, I, I don't remember the the PI's name. Yep, it's out of Germany, close to airline. Wait, and then what do we have to implement these? Um, we call this the, the clip-on camera. That's a component of what you see there. It's adding these fluorine sensors to an existing coil. Um, so for this case, um, they're doing wave IP at 70, um, and had a, this major shading artifact. So they did this um, measurement and realized that they were violating a CPMG condition um, and added a little trim gradient to get it, to get it back. So I ended up getting their signal back. What I have here is 
um, I wasn't in charge of the naming, what we call the Cranberry edition of this, where it slides into the Siemens single channel transmit NOVA system. But one of the major um, issues in integrating these into a system is putting these sensors in the right positions. So there's a few different considerations. They need to be in the right position to support a low noise inversion from a position and frequency measurement to a case-based coefficient. Because if they're not in the right position, they, they can have degeneracies and then you have a, a very noisy coefficient. Second is on these 70 transmitters, there's big rungs of copper running back and forth. And those are little local eddy current sources. And we can't discriminate on the probe whether that's coming from the transmit coil or coming from the cold conductive structures or something like that, which is what we really want to measure. And third, our, our sensors need to be a reasonable distance from a strong susceptibility gradient because that will dephase our probes more quickly. So getting these positions right was a task. That's why we ended up building this whole positioning device um, for that particular coil. Unfortunately, the Philips transmitter is shorter and it doesn't work. These front two probes are too close to copper and it, we'd have to redesign the thing. So we have our reconstruction software, which takes as input um, ISMRM RD format scanner data, uh, synchronizes and combines it with our trajectory data, and then has a CG sense algorithm to reconstruct it. Um, also includes parallel imaging, uh, multi-shot diffusion, uh, and uh, simultaneous multi-slice uh, options, uh, and the ability to use a multi-frequency interpolated uh, delta V0 map to do the static V0 correction. And finally, this is just the, the field camera, the, the original one, just for uh, system measurement or uh, sequence programming, debugging impulse response function measurement, et cetera. So I will skip through this one. Um, here's an image with this, this coil, okay? Uh, comparison of parallel imaging performance between spiral and Cartesian. So if you call it in, in EPI, you can accelerate basically along the phase encode direction. I mean, you can do SMS as well. Um, but if you, ex if you encode in two dimensions, well, then your parallel imaging performance is, is better taken advantage of. Then we integrate into the system by um, just interfacing as a coil. So there's there's the coil half of this RF chain, and then oh, there's okay. 16 for this one. Okay. Yep, it's a it's a brain coverage coil. It's not a head coil. Mm -hmm. So instead of covering the whole head with 32, we went 16 for the brain. And then the field dynamic signal comes out into our separate acquisition system. So this is another preamp and uh, some real time processing hardware. Uh, you had a question about the real-time capabilities. It's about 30, 35 milliseconds from when we get the FID to when we spit out a set of case-based coefficients. So if you wanted to feed back into the shim driver, something like that, that's that's the latency you're looking at. Uh, and then we take this encoding information, as I mentioned, combine it with the MR scanner's raw data. The MR scanner's raw data uh, to make an image at the end. So the end of this chunk of material. Um, one question you asked was about you know, measuring as time goes on. So this is an example of the, the magnet heating. This is the V0 term. So effectively, the center frequency is shifting throughout the scan as it goes on and on. So here you, you're, you're adding a whole bunch of phase because your center frequency has changed. You put a bunch of energy into the magnet during the acquisition. Switch to Here, I'll do something like that. Let me show it. Most of the time, so on this in this case, this is a two ninety eight C seventy. This one stayed pretty stable over the whole acquisition time. I think this is a one minute 2D EPI scan, so not, not very long. Uh, that's coupled to the read gradient. So that's the read gradient. Um, and then, ev I mean, every term will couple to the, the, to the read gradient to some extent. It's not very big. Right? You know, here we're talking um, 0 0.1 radiance. 
maybe big enough you want to care about care about it. I go to radial. It's usually interesting to look at radial and see where your zero your center crossing is. Let's see, no there. I guess this is this is zero minus two minus four radians. So I mean it's it's missing zero at certain lines by a certain amount um, for a, a few few minute long radial scan. And you have a, a thing called the thumb for your shoulder. Um, I could pull up a I could pull up one from the literature. This was the 2013 paper. So this is what I mentioned, playing out different triangles. Um, we cover different frequency components, frequency ranges. Um, and this is a impulse response with and without the eddy current free emphasis. So if I zoom in on scroll correctly. Um, for this particular system, you can see the, see the mechanical rhythm. It's this, uh, the stiffer you make your gradient coil, the further out they go. So if you have a really thin gradient coil, say on a wide bore system, it's a little floppier. This is going to be more towards one kilohertz, and that's where you start to potentially run into issues with your EPI uh, readout trains hitting those resonances. But that's a separate consideration from your imagery construction. So. Yep. So, uh, at what step in the reconstruction pipeline are you incorporating the uh, correction terms and the OD sense and all the unfolding What you're doing, or is it after that? Um, I'll qualify it saying I'm not an algorithms person, um, but what I understand is this it's a CG sense recon, so it's all kind of thrown into a big matrix inversion. Okay. So it's 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 it's, it's solved iteratively because it's too big of a problem to do at once. Um, but if you choose to do delta v zero correction and sense, and use your own trajectory, then it's all thrown into a big matrix solver. The reason is that you know, from this perspective, a lot of effort has been done into like optimizing the sensory transition specific to the hardware and the particular hardware specific correction that used to happen. Independent of all of these higher order uh, creating terms. I was just thinking how we could incorporate if you generate those higher order terms, can we get access and put them in the own Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean the the reconstruction is essentially based on known open math. And and we only built our own because people didn't want to do didn't want to do it. And then we can also make it fast and etc. Um but the, the same Western Ontario group I mentioned, they implemented their whole recon. I think it's in Julia or something like that. And it's it's kind of open. You can go find it on his GitHub page. Okay. Uh, but it's slow. That's the. Trade. But you will give us a dumb output, basically, the higher order terms. Yeah. Everything could be obtained from your system. And yeah. The, it. These, I mean, like, these. Oh, uh, oops. Those the, the, those plots you see, that's just plotted for convenience. You would take the data files and actually you know put them into an MRD file and then use them later. So those that that's what we spit out. Is those those terms. If you want, you can also have the FIDs and the positions, and you can do your own inversion from position and frequency um, into whatever basis function you you like the best. Oh, there's a question on here. Could you comment on the inter-individual variation in field dynamics for both subjects and for scanners? 
That is, when you make these measurements for a scanner, how much do they depend on the subject, the person who's in the scanner? Uh, I'll talk about that one first. Uh, there's a paper by Pierre Francois van der, van der Mortel from 2001 where he did this at 7T and went through a few different subjects and saw between five hertz of variation with breathing, and I think up to 21 hertz in measurement in the head with breathing. Some people would say it's dependent on body habitus, like a larger chest wall mass or something like that. Um, I don't think he noted anything about that there. Um, and then uh, for scanners, I would love for someone to do the experiment to take the camera to five different identical scanners, scanner models, and, and see what the answer is. I don't know. Um, not in this paper, but in one of the follow-up papers. And maybe they did this paper. Johanna measured an impulse response function on the same achieva and then did it again three years later. And when you visually inspect the GERF, it looks about the same. I'm not sure that's the right parameter to use, but that's the conclusion they had. On the other side, I showed you some data, the fMRI spiral data with the concurrent measurement, the impulse response, and nominal. That was acquired on a Siemens 7T with a field camera. And then they had the gradient, the gradient coil broke, and they installed a new one, and they found they were not able to use those same measurements for their new gradient coil. So it could be that it's just a, a major service means you need to remeasure these terms or some sort of degradation of the system. Again, I'd love for someone to do that uh, experiment. We were supposed to have someone who's going to do it, and then you know, the last three years happened and nothing got done. So uh, let's see what's the end of it. How different will they be for different MR systems of the same make and model? Yeah, that, that's a great question. That's, that's what I'd love to know. Because we, we know with different vendors, they call it the same model, but really it's a different magnet, or there's a different type of shim tray, or there's a different sub-model somehow. And, and all of these can have minor effects depending on your application. And if your application is right, it could be major effects. So we don't know. Thanks, Jim. Let's make it show. Oh, and then I wanted to show. Oh, Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, is he asking her? Yeah. Oh, we can't hear anyone on the... Is this... Is this... Hold on. Yes, yeah, speaker. Yeah, we can't hear you. I wonder... Mm. Nope, I can't hear him. Oh, this. While he's typing, I'll just pull this up. Not showing it. No. So here, we're we're putting the system in a mode where it's taking a snapshot every two hundred milliseconds, every one hundred milliseconds, and then it's just showing the raw field, and it just keeps updating. So the the field cameras in the system is just just keeps going. Um, and now we have a person walking in the scanner. You can see the door opening there. Um, that red trace is the cold head pulsing. And as they stick their head in the scanner, they stick their arm in, you can see that we can measure the field as changed by the person walking in and just kind of sticking their head into the board. So we'll go back out. Um, I think there's, a, there's another little, uh, yeah. So backing a car up to the, to the back of the scan room wall, you can then see, okay, there's, there's a there's field outside in, in the parking lot. Right. Or you can do fun stuff like watch trams mm -hmm. go by because they pull a whole bunch of current, then you can see that on the field camera. Okay, so this follow yep, up another question. follow up question. Okay. Um, can you imagine a world in which every um, MR vendor tests every eye scan MRI scanner using your system before it leaves the factory? Um, commercially, sounds great. Um, Practically for them, that's a lot of cost for them. So uh, you, you'd ha you have to see what's what's the benefit of doing it before leaving the factory, or probably more interesting than when it, when it's commissioning on site after installation, because so much of the variability in a scanner is when you take all the parts off and you put it all back on again. 
um, things can be quite a bit different. Even just mounting the gradient coil very slightly differently, if it's aligned very slightly differently. Um, yeah, that's something I would like to see. In the end, it really depends on the cost benefits. Yep, exactly. But it's quite easy to use and what's mm -hmm. benefit. Yep. Was, was it that coil, that coil? Yes. Yeah. So, so well, this this is empty, um, and I got it as a demonstrator kit because the paint provider actually put cobalt in their paint. Um, but within that would be the phased array receiver coil, and then sixteen probes arranged around in there, kind of in the right spots. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's what what people really need. Yes. Um, rather than like putting this into this right things and then hook up on that. Well, I mean, for. For 70, if we think about the volumes, there's maybe 170s in the world. And so if, if we build a volume, uh, like a, a high volume, sweet tea, uh, how many 3Ts are in the world? A lot more 3Ts, right? Yeah, probably 5,000, I think, something yeah, like yeah. that, on order. It sounds like this is also beneficial for 3T. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for different applications. So for 3T, we focus mostly on diffusion because that's the hardest one to do. Right. Um, there's a little bit less in terms of the patient-induced field issues because it's just much less prevalent at 3T. If you start looking at more interesting or more exotic applications like steady-state fMRI, the breathing field causes issues even all the way down to 0.5T um, if you do a steady-state fMRI experiment. There was a paper by the NIH group about that um, about a year ago or so. So. Depending on what you want to do, there could be some reason you'd want to do this at. So this is the coil made by yourself. And you this one here. This one, yep. And you sell that for Philips CNMG? We will, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's subject to making sure that it runs on each different scanner. The run is or run on Philips? Uh, there is an install at the ETH on a Philips scanner of, of a version of this. Yep. It's on the older scanner, so it still has the analog receive chain. So to use it on the newer ones, you'd have to use the research coil interface, which is kind of a bummer, but that's, we don't have the, the digital, the, the, you know, the on-coil A to Ds that Philips uses. So first thing, you want to application for the brain, not for the body? For now, we've been focusing on the brain, just for market, size reasons and then building a head coil is it's a bit easier the other big two other big issues um, one is a probe must stay stationary during the experiment otherwise if you don't know the position then your, your model quality degrades um, the second is it needs to be reasonably close to the head because you want to have a good med, um, estimation of the fields that are going on inside that volume um, but also you don't want to be too close to the gradient coil itself because the fields get very nonlinear out there. And one of our assumptions is that we're reasonably close to linear um, in our gradient coordinate system. So we do all of our reconstruction in the gradient coordinate system, not the physical coordinate system because of static gradient nonlinearity. But if you get too nonlinear, it's, it's still going to degrade your model anyway. What is the position of the probe? You mentioned that the location of the position of the probe is important mm -hmm. to the Yep. So we, we've, we've prescribed them to be in what we think are good positions, um, also accounting for the fact that the person you know, has a neck and you can't put one here. Um, and we do a calibration scan before we start the measurement process where we just take an FID to, do, to, to determine the off resonance at that probe position and then do a very weak a two and a half millitesla x, y, and z gradient so we can get the spatial positions of the probes. Let's see if there's any bonus things I won't show. So there's there's a chat and then there's Q and A. Oh, they're the same. Uh, and I'll just 
one thing I didn't cover is the kind of relative contribution of each of these fractions. Again. So for 3t, doing 0 to the first order, um, adding your static up to 0, which is what you should do, and then adding um, in the third order. Let me see what should I have to do. Is this um, for any people on the cell side? Is that what it is? Sulcus? Cortex? Something? This is, um, so resolving those details does support diffusion. Require that you do this higher spatial order characterization of the system. From there, I would let you know I don't have anything else unless you have more questions, which are great. Well, what's the longest field in the fluorine probes? Uh, in fluorine probes, it's field strength dependent, so we can dope them differently. Um, for 3T fluorine probes, we'd say you can usually get out to about 75 or 80 milliseconds for a well shim system. As soon as your shim starts to degrade, then you have one probe which hits zero magnitude before the others, and then you're then you're done. So, so since close to about 60, it's about the same size, 60 milliseconds. 60 is pretty safe. Right? I mean, because we're unwrapping phase along the FID, once you hit zero, you lose your capability to unwrap. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the field camera itself, just a field camera in the acquisition system. Um, um, that's that's the one I'm not showing. Let's go to a picture of it. So the one on the left there, field camera itself. Um, we take a bit of margin hit and we sell it for about 150k. Um, if you step up to the 70 clip on camera version, um, and then include the reconstruction software. It's going to be somewhere around 300. Um, the coil itself plus the recon is a bit over 350, probably. The back end is, is universal. So the what we call the acquisition system, you can use for each of the front ends, of which the NeuroCam clip on camera and the dynamic field camera each are a different front end. So they all plug into the same cables. Then I do have to say that you know the, the sequence integration and the data conversion to the ISRM RD is something that you guys would have to handle because we can't get into the we don't have access or don't have a research agreement to be able to touch any vendor code. I guess from the roadmap from the, yep. the ideal situation for ISM both, both you and the, the user will be to integrate and locally test groups or to the seamless. So yes. Integrate, integrate your system into their their product, then it will be cheaper. I think it will be mm -hmm. less expensive and easier to use. Yep. So that must work with this whole thing. Yep. Yes, it will. Anyone who buy yep. vision or something or the case of similar, you know, this value will just check this box and okay. Do a full camera enabled. Yes, and and the state we're at now is is motivating, you know, people who want to do this and have a really big application problem where they can't get it done otherwise to generate all the results, which then means other customers ask vendors, can we have this integrated? And so far, that's about the only way that we can do it. It's a little chicken and egg, I think, that it's, it's not seen like that, but integrate on yep. this integrity harder for people to use it to generate some useful yep. data. So, so we love, you know, big market, you cannot sell that. Right. So right now we have about 30 sites who are up and running in various stages of generating their own data. Uh, last year and this year were very productive. And you know, we always try to make people aware of when new papers come out with everything working, which is the key part. Everything has to work. You're adding another subsystem to an MRI scanner, which is already complex. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Just a little bit wrong, which means the images don't, don't turn out better. Are you tracking tomorrow? Uh, NIH. Yep. Well, starting tomorrow. So we'll, we'll install tomorrow on one site. Just No. Uh, Carlo Pierpoli and then at BAB. Um, and then actually, Adrian Campbell Washburn's had one at 1.5T for years. 
she was doing the spiral interventional work. I think she was only doing first order recon because it was a it was a latency thing. So watching these catheters in real time. The system used for our humans kind of cannot be used for our one point five T, they're close enough. Three uh, T, you have a one twenty eight megahertz scanner, then a one twenty three point whatever for Siemens. And the our hardware interface are, are not a problem. The hardware interface, oh, so like like a a, a, a coil. No, yeah. you, you have to have a separate one for each different scanner. The, the coil drive and electronics are very different. What would the battery speed come up? That should be close enough, right? Um, at one point five T, it is. At three T, it's not. So our our probes. Maybe within 800 kilohertz, you're, you're okay if you're in different center frequencies, but they're about four and a half megahertz off between Siemens and Philips and GE. So you can you can use the same one between Philips and GE, which is actually what, what we plan to do tomorrow down at the NIH uh, if we can get everything worked out. Siemens so far to like 2.89. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you can have a sort of a longer thing that the people can run for like a month. Try it out on their <laughs> Had that question a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right now we don't. Um, I don't. My my counterpoint to that would be is right now it's just too hard to get anything up and running. I don't think a month would be sufficient to do something. So it'd just be a lot of frustration. You have it for a month and then it leaves. You really have to find a kid application and sort of get the same. Either 7T or high resolution type better computers. Yeah. Just then, it's for normal scanning. My, the way that I describe it, you have to have someone who has a big enough problem that they need to solve, but they're willing to go through the pain to do all of this. But it helps with spectroscopy. Um, there is some early literature for narrowing line widths based on field feedback. So if, if you control the resistive shims more precisely based on what's actually going on in the system, you can get a, a narrower line width. Um, I have a few abstracts about that. No one really pursued it so far. But it's for, for CEST, guys, you need that, right? You have this center frequency determination and it's quite, you have things to work. It's possible. Ah, was that? Was that? If you have this, you don't need WASA, okay. right? Because you have a location specific mapping of P0. Well, that's static, static P0. So static P0 is a different problem from what we're measuring. So, so let me go back to. It's any current, so it will change the center P0. Okay, I'm not as familiar with CEST either. Um, just going back to, I should have just gotten out. This is the healthy for any time. So it so it's, it's it is or is not a static static field map like. Like that? Is, is that what you're talking about? I'm not familiar with that. No, no, no. Okay. In sense, you can kind of find the uh, center mm -hmm. frequency for each location, mm -hmm. and then you can you can take that grid of randomness. So for each box, mm -hmm. you can know what's the center frequency for each location. With subtraction between counter side and op the opposite side of the frequency band. Okay. So I, I do think that matters. That is, even if you do a B0, once you have graded on, the actual field can change. Mm -hmm. And that's what the optical source has on. But that's that's what we measure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. More hard questions. Is it fun? No more questions.